On November of 2014, right after the midterm elections, President Obama put out a YouTube video and a press release saying that he wanted the FCC to adopt what's called Title II, a heavy-handed common carrier regulation that was built for the railroads in the 19th century and for Ma Bell in the 20th century. It was unprecedented for the president, any president, to direct an independent agency in the way he did. Our chairman decided that ultimately the political pressure was too great, and on February 26th of 2015, he and two of my colleagues voted to adopt these net neutrality regulations. Part of the difficulty that we face at the FCC is that we administer the Communications Act of 1934, which has been amended occasionally over the subsequent eight decades. But the net neutrality decision that the FCC adopted in February of 2015 is now treating every internet service provider as what is called a telecommunications carrier. And that is a term of art under the Communications Act. By reclassifying every ISP as a telecommunications carrier, we now are opening the door to the FCC and other state governmental entities uh, treating internet access the same way we do telephone service. The problem is that now we are facing a digital marketplace that is dramatically different from anything Congress could have envisioned. We have cable companies and telephone companies and wireless companies and satellite companies and others all competing to provide the same service. And so Congress, recognizing this fact, has been involved in a years-long conversation about how to modernize the legislation in order to give the FCC clearer authority over this uh, digital domain. And that is a conversation that the FCC essentially short-circuited when it decided to apply 19th century regulation uh, to the 21st century broadband marketplace. Instead of treating this dynamic industry as a free market success story, they adopted a backward-looking approach, treating the internet essentially as you would treat the water company or the electric company, as a slow-moving utility. Net neutrality itself, it was first coined by an academic who wanted to come up with a way to persuade the government to get involved in the digital space. After all, who would be against anything that is neutral? I don't believe that net neutrality is, in fact, a popularly held view. The best evidence of that would be a survey that was done by the Progressive Policy Institute, a left of center think tank. A vanishingly small fraction of Americans actually knew what the term was. An even smaller number were passionate about it. 79% of the Americans surveyed wanted the FCC to disclose more details about what it was uh, that they were proposing to do. And strikingly, only one in three had wanted the FCC to treat internet service providers and other players in the broadband ecosystem the same way we treated the slow-moving telephone monopoly, Ma Bell. Well, I've met with startup entrepreneurs in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I've met with inner city parents in Los Angeles. I've met with Alaska native villagers above the Arctic Circle. And consistently what they tell me is that when they say net neutrality, they, what they really mean is more broadband competition. They want a faster, better, and cheaper internet experience. And that, I think, is the most unfortunate part about this debate, is that it's taken our eye off the ball, which is getting more broadband competition and allowing all kinds of entrepreneurship and innovation on top of that platform. And the more onerous these net neutrality regulations are, the more we dampen the incentive of the private sector to take the risk, to deploy the capital, to build those networks. And that is something that I think, unfortunately, many Americans don't appreciate.